Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Policy and Practices November webinar. Um, today's topic is how to find the right debt solution for everyone, and we're delighted to see so many people here on the webinar this morning. Um, just while we wait for a few more people to join us, um, I'd just like to do an audio check with you, uh, and I point you to the panel on the right-hand side uh, where we can do an audio check. So please do raise your digital hand uh, for me and um, let me know that you can hear me okay. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, secondly as well, in that same panel, uh, what I'd just like to point you to is that uh, that's where you ask um, the questions as well. Um, so please do ask questions throughout the whole of the webinar and we, we have plenty of time for them at the end of the session. Um, we have a download in that same panel, that's our product brochure, so do, pl do please download that um, and also we are going to be having some polls and then there'll be a survey at the end. So nice and interactive for you today. Um, we do aim to finish by 11.30. We have a huge amount to get through. Um, so do bear with us if uh, we do go slightly over uh, because of course we've got um, two minutes in, in the middle. Um, we would like you to stay and please do stay if you can uh, for an optional 15 minute demo at the end. Um, uh, and like I say, we're gonna have a two, uh, we're gonna observe the Armistice Day, Armistice Day two minute silence at 11 a.m. Um, the slides and the recording of the whole session uh, will be sent to you automatically, so no need to uh, be worrying about taking notes. Um, and if you're on Twitter, um, please do follow us. We're policy underscore practice, uh, and it will be great to get some new followers as well. And we will follow you back. So, fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your raising your hands. Uh, that is great to see. Uh, what I would like to do right now is introduce you to our excellent panel of speakers today. Um, so if our panelists could put their cameras on and uh, unmute yourselves, that would be fantastic. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague um, Zoe Charlesworth, who is Director of Policy and Operations at Policy and Practice. Um, Zoe, do you want to say hello? Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Morning, Zoe. Um, I would also like to introduce you to Carol Kenny, uh, Director of Welfare and Customer Care at the CEDA Group and also President of Civia. Carol, do you want to say hi? Morning, everyone. Morning, Carol. Uh, and also I'd like to introduce you to Gareth McNabb, who is the Social Innovation Lead at Nationwide Building Society. Gareth, do you want to say morning? Good morning, everybody. Hi, Gareth. And also my colleague, Sarah Lambert, who is Affordability Assessment Sales Manager at Policy and Practice. Sarah, do you want to say hi? Morning, everyone. Morning, Sarah. Thank you very much, everybody. And you'll be hearing from our speakers um, later on in the session. Um, but before we do that, uh, and in, uh, I'd just like to move on. Uh, for those of you who have maybe not heard about policy and practice before, I know there's a lot of new people on the webinar today. Um, just a tiny bit about us. Uh, we exist, we're an organisation that exists to give the best support, um, to help you, sorry, to give the best support you can to help people on their way. And we do that in three different ways. Uh, we do policy analysis, uh, we have our software, and we do data analytics today. And uh, we do data analytics, but today we're going to be talking about our software. Um, very quickly though, uh, we're a team of professionals with extensive knowledge of the welfare system, and like many of you, I'm sure, we are passionate about making social policy work. Um, we help over 100 local authorities use their household level data to identify vulnerable households, target support to them, and then track change over time. Uh, but the thing that we're talking about today, as I mentioned, is our award-winning benefit calculator, uh, which engages over 10,000 people every day. We identify the steps that people can take to increase their income, lower their costs, and build financial resilience, uh, which, as we're going to talk about today, is very much in need. Um, so the agenda for today's session, Zoe is going to take us through uh, some policy overview that's setting the scene, the context, uh, and understanding our financial resilience before COVID-19 uh, uh, hit us, uh, and then also during COVID-19, and what that outlook is for the future. Uh, and then Carol is going to talk to us about the collection sector, uh, what's happening right now in the collection sector, and also, again, looking to the future as well. Uh, Gareth is going to talk about the lending sector uh, and looking again to the future. Uh, and Sarah is going to talk to us about the practical tools to help people to build their financial resilience. Um, as I say, we have time for questions and answers at the end and the optional 15 minutes of the demo as well of the software. So fantastic. Now, so in order to get us started, I'd like to ask our first poll of you. Uh, and this will lead us nicely into Zoe's session in a moment. 
Um, so the question that I would like you to answer um, is, at the start of the year, at the start of 2020, uh, way back in the midst of time before COVID hit us, um, what percentage of households didn't have enough savings to live on for a month uh, without income? Is it 1%? 21%, 31%, 41% or 51%? And I'm sorry, let me just launch that for you now. You should see that there on your screen. Sorry about that. So yeah, so the question is, at the start of 2020, what percentage of households um, didn't have enough savings to live for a month without income? That's great to see the uh, results coming in. Thank you very much. Um, it's a very important statistic, and Zoe is going to be covering this um, in, in, a, in a moment. It's just good to see um, what the current levels of knowledge are. Um, brilliant. Let me finish that poll now, because I've got another one very quickly, and I'll share that with you on screen. So nearly half of you um, think that the 51% uh, of households um, didn't have enough savings to live for a month without income. Very stark times. So secondly, um, if I move on, I have another poll for you, right, bang on the heels of that. Um, how many households have missed a council tax payment um, during the pandemic? And I think this is just one council tax payment. So how many households uh, have missed a council tax payment during the pandemic? So this is during COVID-19. So the answers that I've given to you there to choose from are, is it 800,000 households? 1.4 million households, 1.8 million households, 2.4 million households, or 2.8 million households have missed a council tax payment during the pandemic. Brilliant, thank you very much. So I can see that most people have voted. Thank you, let me close that and share the results there. And what we see, very interesting, 36% of you say 2.8 million households have missed a council tax payment, and 35% 35, 35 of you say 2.4 million households uh, have missed a council tax payment. And we shall be going on shortly for uh, handing over now to Zoe, uh, who's going to take us through the actual numbers. Brilliant, thank you so much. Yes, thank over, you so much, Janet. Over to um, you, Zoe. I think, I think the results of that poll show that we've got a very knowledgeable, um, knowledgeable group of delegates on here today. Um, because some of those figures are quite shocking, aren't they? Um, we'll come on to some of the answers as we go through. But I think we're going to start by saying that um, the, the focus on debt at the moment and the um, increase in debt, uh, a lot of it's due to COVID, but the COVID didn't, you know, the impact of COVID um, was sort of over, was an overlay over where we were before. Um, and we've, we've been a um, low savings, high debt society for quite a while. Um, this is pre-COVID, 10% of the UK households had no savings. About a third um, had less than 600 pounds. And this obviously, um, with, with that low level of savings, there was a high level of financial debt. Uh, £9,400 in 2019 was the average debt. Um, and that isn't organised, that isn't necessarily um, debt that's a reasonable um, thing to take on. Uh, this is at excluding mortgages. Um, you know, a bit of debt and to a loan for a one-off purchase may be a reasonable thing for a household to have, but 44% found that debt burden, burdensome. And we come to the answer to the poll here. 41% of households don't have enough savings to live for a month without income. So a lot of people, I think it's about 50, same number said that as said 51%, but obviously this is really high. So even before COVID, we weren't, most households in the UK were not in a position to deal with a financial shock. So we'll move on to the impact of COVID now. So then COVID hit us, the pandemic hit us, incomes really took a battering. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, Janet. There's been a 90%, after September 2020, there's been a 90% increase in people moving to universal credit. There's now 5.7 million people relying on our main means-tested benefit. 2.7 million of those are unemployed and looking for work. And that, others will be carers or people who, whose income has reduced, so they're just getting a top up of their income, um, or they're ill, uh, disability, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but that's a 117% 100, increase since March 2020. In August 2020, there were 7.5 million people on furlough. 
Now that reduced as people were made redundant um, in uh, September, October. Um, the, the latest furlough scheme means some of those can be re-employed, but so we're expecting it to be similar numbers, if not higher, when the figures come out um, for December and November, December. And there's been 800,000 job losses uh, since February 2020. Now, there's some really, we're only obviously, we've had the second lockdown now, and the latest estimates are that the number of job losses um, by April 2021 will be in around the 2 million mark. So this is obviously real, a financial shock um, hitting many, many households in the UK. This obviously has an impact on debt. There's 6 million um, adults who've fallen behind with um, at least one bill. And 2.8 million have missed a council tax payment. So most people got that right. Yeah, amazing. Um, that's a huge number of people in debt. Thanks, Janet. Uh, just a reminder that um, people, out, people not being able to work or not being economically um, active at this time are caused by a number of factors. Um, just uh, draw your attention to the um, column on the right. You can see that an awful lot of these, um, the dark blue at the bottom, are people who are away from work due to um, uh, due to COVID-19 but not being paid. So for some, there are there are certain jobs that if you're not working, you don't get paid, and many many of these are sort of your zero hours um, jobs um, or jobs where there is no um, uh, coverage for sick pay or people don't earn enough to get statutory sick pay. And another large group are affected are the self-employed who fell through the gaps of the self-employed income support scheme. And for a lot of these people, their um, business is just on hold until um, the end of the end of the pandemic, or there's a, an opportunity to build up again. Thanks, Janet. And I, I, I put this slide in here because I think we need a reminder that because somebody claims universal credit, we've seen that huge rise in um, people moving on to benefits. That doesn't mean that they necessarily have enough money to make ends meet. Um, since 2018, UK, our welfare safety net has its own welfare safety net, which is food banks. Um, uh, and whether people um, will be able to um, either service debt or have enough to live on if they move on to means test of benefit is often decided by um, how much debt they have when they come on to it. Um, as well as if they need to take an advance, if they need to take an advance, automatically their personal allowance can be reduced by to up to 30%. So you've already um, putting people at high risk of not being able to have enough to live on. The main risk factors, though, are te for tenants. I mean, tenants, people with children, people with previous debt, there is always a risk with these groups that welfare benefits will not be sufficient. I've, this is um, the graph on the right is a um, graph that was produced by the um, Trussell Trust, and it's in the House of Commons Library for the report um, on food banks from uh, in this month, um, if anybody wants to have a look. On the right, I've put in the projection in that report for the uh, 2021 um, food bank um, usage. And yeah, we can see a rise of over 150%. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of people who will not even be able to pay um, the standard bills, including food bills for their households. Thanks, Janet. Obviously there are support measures and it was really welcome um, news um, last week or the week before, where we heard that the job retention scheme was going to go back to the 80%. Um, <clears throat> there are a few similar rules. I mean, this worked very similar to the previous um, uh, coronavirus job ret retention scheme. People must have been on the um, payroll on the 30th of October. There is provision for people who were let go because redundancy notices have been served um, and they'd been let go because the furlough scheme was coming to an end. There is provision for those people to be re-employed through the next furlough phase. Self-employed grant alongside this has been extended. At the moment, it's a three-month grant that covers to January 21. It's going to be, um, there, there is already provision for it to be another three-month grant following that. We won't know the level of that until we get, we get closer to um, February. Various other measures, grants to businesses, the minimum income floor for self-employed um, uh, people has been extended until, um, well, the lifting of the minimum income floor has been extended to April 2021. For the, those of you who don't work in welfare benefits, that means that people whose 
um, trading profits are down will actually be assessed for benefit on their actual income rather than a notional income. Other, um, other measures are the benefit increases that originally um, introduced with the support for housing um, costs for private tenants being um, increased to the 30th percentile of local, um, um, local rates has been carried on until April. Um, and local authorities have been um, provided with 170 million pounds to help uh, feed children over Christmas. And this was obviously in response to the Marcus Rashford um, campaign. It's not an ongoing support. Um, some local authorities think it'll see them through from Christmas until the next half term. Um, but we'll wait and see if provision ends up being ongoing. There's quite a, a lot of movement behind that. Even with all this, people are falling through the gaps. In particular, employed and self-employed um, people who are not eligible for either the coronavirus job retention scheme or the self-employed income support scheme. And these people may, may qualify for universal credit, may not, depending on, on their circumstances. They're all, yeah, there are households not eligible for universal credit, either due to the partner's income. And this comes as quite a shock to a lot of households where they've had very separate income. Um, over £16,000 in capital, again, a major problem for self-employed because they might have been put mon money aside to pay for tax. The biggest group that falls through the gaps are those with no recourse to public fund and students who can't rely on families to support them. So we've been working during, um, during term time to cover their costs um, and that work is no longer available. There are also those who don't benefit from the government's £20 a week uplift that was um, intended to help people through um, the pandemic. And those are households who are in receipt of legacy benefit, but it would actually be detrimental for them to move over to universal credit. And also those who are benefit capped. Um, there's no point having an uplift in benefits if the benefit cap doesn't go up. And within uh, for tenant, private tenants in many areas, there is no uplift in benefit at all because of the benefit cap. Thanks, Janet. And how does this, this affect debt? Well, there's a mate, we um, undertook some recent analysis for the uh, uh, GLA, the Greater London Authority, looking at council tax debt um, and the correlations, what causes council tax debt. Um, and the biggest correlation we, we found was with poverty. Uh, it's not, no surprise. I mean, for those who are interested, the second biggest correlation was with the local council tax support scheme. So, um, yeah, areas with more poverty, higher, higher um, have lower collection rates. Um, and this is a very, very strong correlation. Thanks, Janet. Just to remind us that this making plans for how to support people through debt at the moment is actually quite tricky because there is so much uncertainty still to come. The original OBRS worst case scenario for the number of people likely to be made redundant from um, after furlough was 10%. This is now likely to be increased. Uh, you know, at the start of furlough, way back at the beginning of the year, we thought that would never happen, but it's now that is seen as actually a pretty good case scenario. Some of the benefit measures, are the uplift in benefits, um, they're due to end in April 2020, um, I've got 2020 there, 2021. Um, and we, we're not absolutely certain if they'll be carried on or if that, you know, benefit levels will actually drop and we'll see even more food bank usage. And of course we have Brexit and the, the impact of Brexit is not really known. Again, when we did initial modelling at, at the um, beginning of the year, um, when we were trying to see um, the impacts on, on poverty in the future, we were looking at, a, a, you know, no deal scenario was not even on our minds. So, you know, the worst case scenario there may be the impacts may be worse than we possibly imagined. So there's a lot of uncertainty on the way. So making plans for debt repayments, making plans for how to recover debt, how, how to support people who are really struggling at the moment is really difficult with all this uncertainty on the horizon. Thanks, Janet. This is all getting very depressing, isn't it? I just want to point out that there is support available. A lot of local authorities are doing in incredible things. We're working with local authorities who do amazing things to support people who are really struggling financially. There, we have a web page ourselves, and I would, I would, um, if you know, do use it, do look at it. It does help people to sort of navigate what support is available for them, and it directs them to our calculator and other, other, other um, areas and other agencies that can support them. So 
do have a look afterwards. Uh, I think that's it, Janet. I'll move on to, um, yeah, your next speaker. On, on to Carol. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Zoe. And just to point out that this graphic does say uh, the page is last updated 26th of September. That isn't correct. Uh, the page is updated as and when uh, new information is announced by the government. So uh, this is an old graphic. So I do apologise if that's misleading at all. Um, however, thank you ever so much, Zoe. Really interesting. Great to get that context setting. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to Carol Kenny, uh, who's going to take us through the uh, what's happening in the collection sector. Lovely. Thanks very much, Carol. Thanks so much, Janet, and thank you, Zoe. That was fascinating information and really important that um, that we're we're very mindful of um, of of the impact, uh, particularly in the in the collection sector. So just to introduce, I'm Carol Kenny, and I'm the director of welfare and customer care at Cedar Group, and I'm also the president at Civia. And what I'll do, I'll just explain to you um, very briefly. Um, what Civia are and what type of collection we're involved in. If, if you don't mind clicking to the next one, please, Janet, thank you. So the Civil Enforcement Association represents 95% of the industry. Um, we have 33 member enforcement agencies and that supports approximately 2000 enforcement agents. Now Civia members collect over 550 million pounds per year um at no cost to the public purse the debts that are passed to enforcement agencies are largely debts owed to local or central government which have already been to court and a warrant obtained now for the purpose i think when we talk about household debt and concerns around um, poverty people are very focused on council tax collections and um, I'll, I'll broadly talk a bit more about that through through this um through this presentation but just to give you a bit of context, once a council tax liability order is obtained and is passed to enforcement agent, there is an initial stage in our collections process, which is called the compliance stage. Um, and during that stage, enforcement agencies are utilizing the same collection strategies, technology and data sources as private debt collection agencies would be um, and lenders, et cetera. Now, over 50% of cases passed to an enforcement agent are collected at this stage and without the need for a doorstep visit. That's not always recognized um, that actually so much is undertaken in a debt collection uh, manner. 64% of council tax cases that are passed to enforcement agents um, over the last tax year, pre-COVID, um, were resolved uh, via repayment plan, 64% of them. We expect that to be higher, of course, as we, as we move forward. Um, now, an important thing, and if we consider challenges kind of post-COVID, I've just put a, um, a figure there that actually the challenges on local authorities and that they're facing a 7.4 billion shortfall in funding due to the impact of COVID-19 on council revenue. And that data came from the Local Government Association. Now, a YouGov survey that we undertook um, in, 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 that was undertaken in August uh, showed that actually 65% of adults are concerned that local services are at risk if fewer people pay their council tax. So we can start to see how the impact of people being unable to pay their council tax has that direct impact, of course, on, on, on local services. If you could move on, please, um, Janet, thanks. So I'm just gonna talk quickly more about the challenges uh, for enforcement. So for the sector that I'm involved in um, and the collection of public debt, and there's many challenges, of course. We, you know, we support 33 members through Civia, and we're all businesses um, operating and having to utilise the furlough schemes. We had um, a ban on enforcement visits during the the initial lockdown period, and of course, um, we we're not receiving fresh uh, cases through the system as well. So the, you know, the the impact on the sector is, is certainly um, a concern as well. Now, looking at kind of the wider challenges and what I see as we look forward um, coming through this pandemic, one of the biggest challenges is that there is this general belief that the collection of debt is considered unfair, and particularly during a global pandemic. And we've seen lots of calls of, well, people shouldn't be trying to collect money um, during a pandemic, and enforcement agents shouldn't be visiting during a pandemic. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's that type of perception. And I think because we have that negativity and that perception, we continue to see low customer engagement. So people aren't picking up the phone as much as we'd like them to. They're not responding to letters and we want to see an improvement through that. So that's a big challenge. And I think, of course, the main challenge, and it doesn't go without, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious. We expect to see a, a much higher number of customers facing financial validity um, and, and, and a new type of debtor, so to speak. So people um, who, who would, would, would normally be able to repay, would have had no problems in the past with their direct debits for council tax or to make a repayment offer if, 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 if a debt was passed through to enforcement agents, they are now um, concerned, of course, that their income is, 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 is potentially volatile, that they, they, you know, what happens when the, the government um, support schemes end and, you know, facing potential redundancies. So we know that we need to be very mindful of that and a lot of the data that, that Zoe shared with us. And just another one that always um, that is always fresh in my mind is that 30 million people in the UK lack any savings to fall back on should they suffer a 25% of income. Well, that's a lot of people um, on, on, on the furlough scheme and, um, and, and something we really need to be mindful of when we're attempting to collect debt. Now, if I move on to CEDA Group and what we're doing and how we're approaching um, collections, we launched a fairness framework um, in August when CEDA was, was formed. And actually, this framework is something that's been, um, we've been working on this for three years now. So actually, this is something that's embedded into our business and where we've conducted a wholesale review of all of our policies, looking at the culture of um, our collections and our, our staff and actually what is the appropriate way to collect debt and fairness of course is 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 the key to ensuring that we we find that right balance between collecting the much needed public funds but also ensuring we do so in a proportionate way that doesn't impose any undue hardship on on those who are vulnerable or suffering financial vulnerability, um, even, even in a short-term scenario. So our framework, um, you know, it's a detailed slide, I apologize, I you know, copied a few slides here just to, to give you an overview of actually the thought process that's gone into this and how it is embedded every part of our process. Now underpinning that is our fairness charter, if you don't mind just clicking through, Janet, thank you. Yeah, so our fairness charter, which is very simple. And again, if you if you click through those, Janet, that's fine. We've got three principles and three practices which deliver that one core outcome, which is debt fairly collected. So that's honouring our, our, our obligation to collect public funds, um, which is the correct thing and the right thing to do to support those vital services, but ensure that we must do it in a fair manner. And fairness to us means we have to treat each individual circumstances and find a, a resolution that balances that important need and helps people um, or releases people from that burden of debt. Thank you, Janet. I'm going, to just, I'm going to just jump in there, if I may, because I'm conscious now that I want to um, give uh, 11 minutes at uh, the uh, Armistice Day silence. Thank you, Carol.
Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get. Uh, you, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, let me get back to the slide you were on, Carol. Sorry. Um, do I need to go back to this slide? That's fine. Pop. No, the next slide's perfect. Thanks, Janet. I don't need to say anything. In the, <laughs> I, can, I'll, I, I will whiz through these. I've I've taken some extracts from our vulnerability strategy here, so I won't read through in detail. Don't panic, and the slides will be available for you. But one of the core um, the the core parts of our fairness uh, framework is our vulnerability strategy and our approach to vulnerability. And of course, that's heightened and been heightened through through the COVID pandemic. And you know it's been helpful, of course, to have embedded processes in place to ensure we can deal with affordability for forbearance for and and ensure we can support people. And um, you know we've got plenty of stats to show how how we how we have operated um, through this pandemic. But one of the core things, just to point out, of course, is that a lot of the debt we're currently dealing with is is pre-covid debt so we haven't seen those those cases come through in terms of um debt accrued during this pandemic so that is a a, a future challenge of course for us um but what we have seen that when you allow debt to stagnate actually it becomes a lot more harder to collect and our concerns for the customer are that it it's something that continues to weigh down on them and, and is a burden. So it's really important that we, um, you know, we continue to engage and that we continue to show customers that we have an embedded uh, framework and process for supporting them and making sure that they, you know, they 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 have the ability to do that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you, Janet. Just a quick extract from a vulnerability strategy. You'll see here that CEDA have aligned um, our, our core principles to the FCA approach. Um, and you know, we've we've designed 11 vulnerability principles that are really um, you know fundamentally important when we collect debt. Um, and that's looking at, you know those that are potentially vulnerable and also those that are particularly vulnerable and just simply shouldn't be um, in an enforcement process and, and would be returned back to the creditor. Um, one thing I will point out that our vulnerability strategy has also been assessed through the customer service excellence standard and we've received 12 compliance plus marks for that and particularly in relation to how we assess affordability and the use of the benefit and budget calculator. So if you could move on Janet, thank you. Um, and these are just three of the core principles from, for, from our vulnerability strategy, which I think are really um, poignant right now, and look at supporting those who are financially vulnerable. And that's um, having a, a, a framework for assessing affordability, um, an approach to flexibility and empowering staff to do the right thing, and then um, a policy on, on referrals to independent debt advice. So our, and this is how we achieve a balanced, um, you know, a, a, a balanced out view for, for both the customer and the creditor. So we look at how we recover those monies in a fair manner, but we absolutely have a consistent um, standardized approach to assessing affordability, which is through the standard financial statement. And that's a little bit content, more contentious in, the collection of public debt because of course these are unpaid taxes or fines um, but actually if you use this um, alongside the benefit and budget calculator you can see how we can really complement um, data and intelligence and looking at maximizing um, benefits and income for customers to deliver a real you know wholesale approach to to achieving the best outcome for both the creditor and the customer and you know we have a very set policy on those customers who um, are perhaps you know have a deficit budget or they have multiple debt issues that we need to refer them to independent debt advice and we have links to the money advisors network so that's just a very brief overview of some of those core principles and, and how they're supporting uh, vulnerable customers a very quick case study again there's a lot of information here because of course cases that come through to enforcement are very complex uh, this is a very recent one about a council tax case um, and a lady called alexandra 
Now, she went through the council tax process and you'll see that actually reminder letters, a summons, a 14 day letter was issued prior to the instruction of enforcement agent. Um, we went through an extended compliance stage process, which is quite normal again for council tax, that's 28 days of collection strategy to, to, to um, encourage engagement. We received no response. It then progressed through the statutory process to an enforcement stage and a visit at her doorstep. Now, the customer had a very, um, you know, very uh, amiable conversation with the enforcement agent. He explained she needed to make a, a lump sum payment and then a payment arrangement to clear within the tax year, which she agreed to. And then actually um, she contacted us afterwards in tears and very upset because the payment she agreed to make left her with with insufficient funds in her account and this was dealt with through our welfare team who immediately arranged a refund of the money through a fast payment placed the case on hold and then scheduled a video call for the following week just to give her a chance to kind of um you know get get her head around how how to deal with this we carried out an affordability assessment using the benefit and budget cal calculator, which you know identified her el eligibility for work and tax credits, single person discount because she'd gone through a, a, a relationship breakdown. And we entered into a sustainable repayment, repayment plan with her and some action plans to, to assess utilities and things where she was paying, we believed, um, higher than she should be. Now, that's a, that's, that's a very common example of the type of people that come through enforcement too scared to pick up the phone and deal with it at the front end and actually you know she was very apologetic but very upset and clearly needed support and we were able to do that for her um but it's 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 quite reflective of of, the, of of debtors that we see and janet just that final slide please thank you so just where I think we need to focus on action, and that is certainly about removing the stigma of debt and the perception of collections, that actually we have support um, in place to help people and to help them get, you know, release themselves from that burden of debt or to obtain independent advice. To continue to improve customer engagement, you can see there we've adopted various different strategies. A number of people have contacted her. She just hasn't reached out until she had that knock on the door. Um, and then, you know, I really think the key important things are to embed, a, a, you know, standardised process for assessing affordability and empowering staff to be flexible, to do the right thing and to achieve, you know, an individual and balanced resolution. And that's that's it from me. I apologise. I've, I've, I've gone over the mark and um, I think I've lost the bet to Gareth in terms of who couldn't keep to their time limit. Apologies. Yeah, absolutely no problem at all. Thank you very much, Carol. And I'm sure everybody has got lots of questions for you. I can see some in the panel there. So that's fantastic. We'll come to them shortly. Thank you ever so much, Carol, for that wonderful session. I just quickly want to, before as a bridge then to go into uh, Gareth's session, what I'd like to do is another poll, very, very quick poll here, uh, and just ask you how you would rate your knowledge of the welfare system. Uh, and hopefully you should see that there on your screen right now. Um, so uh, this is not intended in any way to uh, um, be a test. Uh, nobody's going to come in and uh, just critique and double check, uh, but just how would you yourself rate your knowledge of the welfare system? Uh, we're very interested, and I think when Gareth does his session, uh, he, it will become clear as to uh, uh, why, why that might be important. Um, Brilliant, excellent. Okay, thank you very much. I shall very quickly close that poll right now and share the screen, the uh, information on the screen. So, 40% uh, of you um, say that you have high knowledge of the welfare system. 37% can deny the here nor there, and 12% have very high uh, knowledge of the welfare system, which is great. And I think that actually tallies with uh, maybe the answers in the earlier polls as well. Um, so very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I am now going to hand over to Gareth McNabb, who is the Social Innovation Lead at Nationwide Building Society. Um, over to you, Gareth. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, what's a social innovation lead when he's at home, right? Um, I, uh, some of you will have come across my path when I was Nationwide's Money Advice Liaison Manager. Uh, which basically was uh, representing nationwide for the debt advice sector and vice versa. 
to ensure that Nationwide's collections and recoveries processes were well informed by the experience of our customers when they become debt advice clients. And I, I took that role on from being a, a, a feedback loop into one that innovated new uh, services for customers in a collection cycle within uh, Nationwide uh, over time, introducing uh, some services that I'll come to a little bit later in my session. Um, and uh, then I, I led uh, Nationwide's Open Banking for Good program, looking to deploy open banking powered products and services for the benefit of the financially squeezed, not the market that that technology is traditionally uh, used for, uh, but uh, hey, a market that absolutely deserves top quality digital tools and products. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit later too. Uh, and then when Open Banking for Good finished, um, I've become responsible for Nationwide social innovation, which basically means when we're innovating or problem solving um, I, I lead our work that's looking to solve problems in wider society rather than problems within the building society uh, so I, my portfolio responsibilities will touch on a lot of things that numbers of you do in your day job although nowhere near as effectively uh, as you do so I was asked to share the lending sectors challenges in a post-covid world and immediately recognized uh, we're not in a post-COVID world yet, are we? Um, I'm in an office in my garden. Many of you will be at home. Very few of you will have seen clients face to face in the last week or two. Um, and I may not know when you expect to do so again. Uh, and so uh, I, I want to frame everything that I'm talking about as uh, Nationwide are very aware that we're in the middle of uh, a COVID world. And some of the flexes that we've made in the last few months will be here to stay. And there'll be many more flexes that we need to make uh, going forward. Um, but I want to call out three key challenges that face the lending sector in a mid or post COVID world. Um, and uh, some of them will, will resonate, some of them will fly straight past your desks because they may have very little to do with your world. But let's see how we go. So, the number one challenge that Nationwide and any other lender is facing right now is loan origination. Where you have the experience that was announced, I think I saw on Twitter earlier today that. Um, in terms of the amount of money saved because of lockdown during the pandemic, households have saved £88 billion collectively since March. So that's an average of £1,600 per person. Uh, I don't have £1,600 sat on the side of my desk that I've saved up because of COVID, and I don't know how many of you will have. But the stats say that there's a whole swathe of society have uh, accrued themselves all kinds of savings and have paid down huge amounts of debt <laughs> Hi, Munir. Um, uh, and, uh, and are doing very, very well for themselves. Thank you very much. Now, they're unlikely to be your clients if you're in the advice sector or if you're in the collections world. Um, but they're also unlikely to be my customers. They are paying down debt and not taking out new loans. Now, why is that a problem? Well, lenders got to lend, right? Um, especially when your model, your business model is nationwide as a building society or as a credit union, a responsible lender. Um, you've got to be able to lend money out at a fair and reasonable rate in order to generate the income to pay interest on savings. And, and the minute that uh, that stops working, the whole show stops. So how do we work out who we lend to and, and how we lend to them if our branches are closed or restricted access? So lenders of, of all kinds of sizes, your friendly local credit union and your massive, massive bank are all scratching their head out. How do we work out who we lend to? Um, and how do we actually get them the money? Especially since one in seven mortgage holders took a payment holiday during the summer. Um, and that later the government extended those still further. Um, none of those show on individuals' credit files. So, um, and understandably so, and there are arguments on both sides of the, the fence there, but essentially what you've got, if you're a responsible lender with a customer asking you to borrow some um, money from you, and you look at their credit file and it says all clear, there's a one in seven chance that they've missed half their mortgage payments in the last year. Um, and that's, that's information that you can't not know, if that makes sense. You can't unknow that a great swathe of society needed to take payment holidays to keep food on the table and um, kids in clothes and all of that stuff. And you don't want to over lend. You don't want to lend to somebody who can't afford to repay. So what, that is one of the challenges is how do you work out who to lend to? But then what kind of loan products are you going to put out? Product design, how do you build products that better fit real life, cradle to grave? So here I'm describing the challenge that we had back in March when we understand we're about to be put in lockdown 
and we're hearing rumours that the FCA at the government's behest are about to insist that payment holidays are applied on all mortgages of all types including buy to let and on all consumer credit products. Now most mortgage lenders will have had some kind of version of a payment holiday available on many of their mortgage products. Many of them didn't apply them on their buy to let mortgages and very very few, almost none, had payment holidays as a flexible option on their personal loan products or on their credit cards. But out of nowhere, the government and the regulator would give us a week's notice that we need them. Uh, and understandably so, with no social with the social security safety net in this country being what it is, consumer credit and forbearance on those consumer credit products be has become our safety net through COVID. Now, how can Nationwide or any other lender sit there knowing that we're, we're entering a period of volatility where um, the government and or the regulator can at any time insist that we change the core design of our products. Uh, that costs us money, it costs us time, uh, we might need to change some infrastructure or work with some third party uh, technicians to, to build that functionality. Um, my question, my stupid question, because I don't know the answer is, why don't we just build them with that flexibility anyway? COVID hasn't caused a problem, it's revealed a problem in society that we've been building loan products for people. Uh, you want to borrow £10,000 over five years, right? 10000 divided by 60, there's your monthly payment, Mr. Smith, because nothing is going to change in your circumstances in the next 60 months, right? You can, that's how we do loans, 60s flat payments. That's how the Consumer Credit Act is worded too. Um, but, but in no reasonable version of the world or your experience of it, is your income the same for 60 months in a row and your outgoings the same for 60 months in a row? So I wonder, might we learn from COVID that uh, lenders building more flexible products that better fit real life, taking individuals and families from cradle to grave, may actually um, not build in the massive problems of huge cost of building these flexibility, flexibility in after the fact, uh, or the huge... Uh, frustration on the customer's part when they're told that they can have a payment holiday but the lender they need it from doesn't know what they're talking about or puts them on a list and will call them back next month when they've built it. Many, many thousands of people experienced that in March and April. And so it's a challenge but one I think that parts of the credit sector are definitely up for, for meeting. Let's creatively think about how we build products that better fit real life. Uh, this will benefit consumers and ultimately will benefit us in terms of our running costs. And then the last challenge, service design. How do we make the most of moments of truth and in whose interest will we do so? Uh, moments of truth is corporate jargon rubbish that I use all the time and won't mean anything to real people doing real work. And um, essentially it's that, that interaction you have with a customer where they're doing a little bit more than reading your website. They're, doing, they're, they're engaging with you and, and, and transacting with you. They're doing something and you have a window of an opportunity to speak to them, show them something or serve them in a way uh, that could change their relationship with you. During COVID, many, many people have told us that they are unable to work because they're sick or they're isolated or they're uh, needing to quarantine. Many people have contacted us to change their address because they're now quarantining with friends or family. Uh, their work circumstances have changed. Our customers are telling us more about their lives than they've ever told us before. And they're doing so in a way uh, that um, the majority of our customers were very up for. Now, Nationwide, like many other organisations, wants to encourage people to use digital as much as they can because it's a lower cost uh, to bear across the whole organisation. It means that we can prioritise face-to-face -face and telephony channels for those people who really, really need them. So many customers are telling us so much more about their life through all kinds of channels now that um, it makes uh, the inquisitive ask the stupid question me, ask, I wonder what we could do here. I wonder what we can do when our customers are telling us that they're losing work. Do we simply flag that this is a loan that may go bad and stick a collections process on the back of a product? Or do we build more flexible forbearance into our products um, in the first place and build service routes and uh, customer journeys, if you will, um, that recognize that when a customer tells us more than we needed to know, that we can do more for them than we put on the label on the product, for example. Why would an organization whose customers are beginning to tell them, hey, I've been put at risk of redundancy, not build some kind of journey or support service that helps people with employability skills, whether through signposting, video support, websites, 
that kind of thing. Why would an organization whose customers are beginning to tell them, um, I've lost work and I don't know how to claim benefits, not put some kind of pathway in place for people to identify what they're entitled to? Why would an organization whose customers are beginning to tell them, my payment holiday over here is running out and I don't know how much longer this one's gonna last, not build smooth journeys into top quality death and benefits advice? But these are questions I've been asking at Nationwide for some time and answering by building services like uh, the career cake uh, approach that we have uh, in terms of employability skills, the income maximization we've been doing for five years now, finding more than a million pounds of extra income for some of our most uh, worried members, worried about their finances. Um, and uh, just this week, uh, we're getting into the, the final stages of uh, engaging with policy and practice around the benefit and budgeting calculator because it's all well and good for me to have put some of these tools into a collections process, but that's sweeping up after an awful lot of stuff's gone wrong, isn't it? And um, what if you build the journey in such a way that people can get hold of these tools and, and services to uh, help improve their, uh, their lives and their outcomes earlier in the cycle, potentially never becoming mine or Carol's customer in a collections department ever. Uh, and so that's for me why I'm excited that we're getting really close to using uh, this benefit in budgeting calculator. So a minute or two on what I really like about it and what I absolutely recommend about it. So uh, first of all, um, as a budget calculator, it's not just a straightforward stick some numbers in a standard financial statement. Well, standard financial statement is uh, good. It works in the world of debt advice and debt collection to try and ensure consistent outcomes when organizations use it as they should. Um, but the standard financial statement isn't an appropriate tool to help somebody who isn't behind in their payments and isn't particularly worried about their payments, but has experienced a life change. And um, the budget uh, in the budget benefit and budget calculator, um, surfacing not what the SFS trigger figures are or trying to depress outgoings artificially in order to secure a debt repayment, and um, by surfacing the ONS uh, comparable data on spending for households like yours in an area like yours, there's a really soft suggestion to an individual or household about where they might begin to make some savings. Uh, I like this because I'm terrified about my collections customers or Carol's collections cust uh, staff um, tell it, getting judgy. Or like, why is it any of my business whether you have Sky or not? Why is it any of my business uh, whether when you've recently, have you recently switched your energy bill? You might have perfectly good reasons why you haven't or can't or are scared and need more support than a throwaway comment from a young naive collections agent might otherwise suggest. And so the ONS data the much more suitable way to help an individual begin to go on that journey of discovery about where are my outgoings now and where could they be. Second benefit is that benefits uh, piece. The journey of using the calculator I find really smooth. So um, I understand enough about the world of benefits to know that I can build one or two things. I can build a super, super smooth digital route that's really easy to use with three clicks. The thing is it won't tell me any accurate information about the benefit entitlement and I can build a 100% accurate benefit calculator that tells me every single in and out of every single benefit in the land, um, even if I'm a, 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 a blind asylum seeker or um, you, you, uh, who's um, entering university. You can get into that level of detail, but the, the perfect one that is 100% accurate is uh, covers every single benefit is a clunky, clunky journey. And the thing I find about uh, policy and practice tool is it balances those two user requirements really really well doesn't compromise on it being a smooth journey for the user doesn't compromise on on it being helpful outputs in terms of seeking to maximize their income and then the third thing is, uh, that I've uh, been recommending to colleagues and, and recommending to people in financial services the world over is um, the beginnings standalone information is good but um, encouraging a consumer to, towards the journey of beginning to make a benefit claim where they may be entitled is even better I don't want to just tell somebody, here's what you could have won. I want to get them on the journey towards maximizing their income, sensibly reducing their expenditure where they can and it doesn't compromise on their health or their household and beginning to repay debt where it's affordable or find a longer term debt solution where that's necessary. So um, that's uh, the world in the middle of COVID. Who knows, maybe the um, injections will heal us all and we don't need to build all these payment holidays or smooth journeys or whatever. But I don't believe that for one minute. I think consumers will benefit from the lessons we're learning through this horrible crisis we're in. Um, thank you. 
Brilliant, Gareth. Thank you ever so much. Um, very, very interesting and lots of questions have come in. Um, I'm, I just want to pick up, I'm conscious of time, so I just want to hand over now to Sarah, my colleague Sarah Lambert, who's very quick going to talk through a few more features of the Benefit and Budgeting Calculator. Over to you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Gareth. So as you've heard, both of our clients there are using the Benefit and Budgeting Calculator. And I'd like to just highlight some of the features of the calculator. And for those of you that have some more time at the end of this webinar, I will be doing a 15 minute demonstration that will show more of the features and more of the information that we hold within there. As we've heard, many people will now need support from the welfare system for the first time, and they won't know what they can claim and probably haven't had to claim before, so won't actually know how to. And it's our job and our clients' jobs to remove the stigma that's attached to people claiming the benefits and make that journey much easier for them. And our clients don't have to be experts to understand that they are giving and have the confidence that they're giving accurate guidance for their customers. And with so many different support, support schemes available, you can empower your customers to have confidence that they're actually tapping into every level of support that they're eligible to receive. You can reduce poverty, increase financial resilience, and avoid detrimental mental health, which is caused by financial uncertainty. We've got a very wide audience here, and I'm sure all of you can understand the impact that all of this is having on your customers. The calculator does allow you to assess full eligibility to support from the welfare system. And it also gives you the ability to build a very realistic budget and an affordability assessment. And as Gareth highlighted, we also have cost of living data from ONS built into the calculator, enabling people to see where they may be overspending and have access to be able to reduce some of their outgoings and build their financial resilience for the future. We use the standard financial statement so that customers can actually have access to the full income and expenditure that you build with them, and they can then save that, download that and share that with any of their creditors and with the debt advice network as well. So your customers won't have to complete the journey over and over again with all of their creditors. It also gives consistency for people so that there is one income and expenditure for them and not seven or eight that they're going through by having several conversations with their different creditors. And as I've said, save, print and download the results and send those to your customers and if your customers aren't digitally aware or don't have digital access, you can simply post it to them as well. So we meet the requirements of data portability under GDPR and guidance from the regulators around let's only have people have to do their income assessment once. As Gareth touched on and I mentioned earlier, we can also give support with budgeted. So cost of living data is available so people can find ways to reduce their costs. This may be something as simple as their internet usage. And we know there's some great schemes being put out there in the market at the moment by some of the big media providers. And giving people the ability to understand where they're on overspending is key, especially if they're facing changes in employment. Our calculator will allow you to understand the full picture of your customer's circumstances. And if you're in the debt advice network, of your client's circumstances. It can show the shortfall, and where they're actually making their spending and what proportion of their outgoings are spent in the different areas of their financial statement. So if you'd like to join us for the next 15 minutes, you can see more of the calculator. We can look to see how you can improve the financial resilience for your customers. And as I'm sure many of you know, fluctuating income can actually make budgeting very difficult for people in receipt of universal credit. And our calculator also allows you to give that customer visibility of what they're going to receive over that period. We also have work sliders built in. These allow a customer and you to see if there's a change in working hours or simply if someone's moving to furlough and receiving 80% of their salary, what's that going to do to their income and how will that change what disposable income they left to pay all of their outgoings. So I look forward to seeing you all for the 15 minutes so we can go further into the calculator. Thank you, everyone.
That's fantastic, Sarah. Thank you so much. And I know that you've got some case studies lined up, haven't you, uh, that you're going to walk people through uh, in, in the demo as well. So it would be brilliant for people to stay. Um, before we do that, though, what I would like to do uh, is just move on to the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for sending in um, some questions uh, throughout. Um, I have a few. So if you if the panelists want to put their videos back on and unmute yourselves, um, that would be amazing. The first question that I would like to ask, um, and I think this came in response to your session, Gareth, but perhaps others want to jump in and, and talk about this as well. Um, but basically somebody talked about how do you, somebody asked, how do you alleviate the fears of open banking? Um, would there be anything in particular, given the topic that we talked about today, uh, Gareth, that you would want to mention about open banking? And then Zoe, maybe if you want to say anything as well on that too. Okay, so uh, fears of open banking, um, it depends on whether you believe open banking is a thing or is a tool to achieve a thing. Um, that may not make very much sense, but essentially, um, uh, open banking is the uh, legal and regulatory mechanism by which bank data can be safely and securely shared with a third party of your choice by your consent so they can provide you a service that you said you wanted. It doesn't get any more secure than covered by law and regulation and it doesn't get more um, a res reliable and responsible when it's governed by the consumer's uh, choice of consent. Um, there should be no product or service built that relies only on open banking. Um, that's one of the principles that uh, I advocate for within Nationwide. But then you let the value exchange stand up for itself. What's in it for the customer? Does this make something faster, easier, more accurate, more beneficial to them? Um, uh, we are in the middle of working with some open banking providers around affordability assessments in collections and recoveries. And uh, the take up rate is uh, pretty good. It's in line with a number of other um, initiatives that I saw while leading Open Banking for Good, where when offered the opportunity to take an open banking route to inform the affordability assessment, that doesn't mean pre-populate, means inform it. And um, when given the opportunity to have open banking inform the uh, affordability assessment, um, around half of people take it and half of people don't. And I think that's brilliant because when you stop people on the street and ask the question of, do you believe in open banking? Do you trust open banking? Um, only about 5% of people, 8% of people do. But that's because when you ask a question in that particular way, you get an answer in that particular way. Show them a product or a service is easier to use if you click here, people click here. Thank you, Gareth. Um, Zoe, what would you say about open banking? Oh, I thought that was really interesting, Gareth. Uh, it's a really, really interesting stat set. And I completely agree um, with Gareth. I think that if things are explicit and upfront and people have a choice, there is always this balance between convenience. I mean, it's, it's in the benefit system already, isn't it? The people are sharing their financial data with the, the RTI going into um, a universal credit and the DWP are moving towards and they're already setting up systems to be able to get bank um, savings information straight into that um, the benefits assessment. There's a lot of concern about this, but I think as long as it's absolutely explicit and upfront and people can choose to go in because it's more convenient to them, than to find all their their savings accounts, etc., or or you know they can choose not to. Um, I think that Gareth's point there was absolutely spot on. For some people, it, it is more convenient to get that support, and it helps them get that support. I, I do think that as long as everything, as long as the security around this has been thought out properly, and people can give explicit consent, I'm not sure it's something we should all be pushing back on. Thank you. Carol, anything to add on open banking? Just that I completely agree with, with everything Gareth said. Um, it's not something we've uh, developed into our, our business, but we are exploring it and, and, and undergoing some trials. So I think that point is so important that it's, it's, it's there to inform, it's there to validate certain information and to make the journey easier for the customer. It's not there to pre-populate or again, to use in that judgy way that Gareth referred to earlier, um, you know, in terms of what, you know how people are spending, but completely, you know, consensus across the board, I think. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, I have a question here now, um, and it, I will just read it out. So I think this probably was 
as a when you were talking carol it might have been yourself um zoe so it's probably directed to either of you too um do you have any recommendations as to how local authorities should collect council tax debt especially as they are struggling with liability orders um zoe what springs to mind there is perhaps our work that you touched on with the gla on the flexible collections work um but i don't want to take yeah, you off piece the, in, the, the, the that question. We, yeah i think the issue we've got in local authorities is, is at the moment, there's so many different practices by so many different local authorities. The flexibility that Carol was touching on, um, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, that even before it goes to organisations like Carol's, that doesn't happen. In, some local authorities do very, very customer focused work around it before it even gets to that stage. The work we did with the GLA, and it's an interesting report, you can um, download it from our, our website. But that actually shows the um, impact of financial resilience by adding on enforcement costs. And it also shows that, um, that actually having a, a really hard and non-flexible and non-customer centered policy makes no difference to collection rates. Where people can pay, they tend to pay. Where people can't pay, they need individual support. So this adherence to really um, strict collection policy because you feel that that's fairer to your wider account, your wider residents, I think it needs a revisit and I think that unless local authorities do start revisiting it, we, we're probably going to see it regulated. Um, Carol, I'm not sure what you want to say when once it gets passed to you. Yeah, but well, well, I get, you know, the council tax collections is under the, the spotlight at the moment and there is um, a call for evidence into the public debt collection and that you know what what you've said is quite right and i'm really pleased though i think you said at the beginning of, of, of this session that there are some local authorities doing some really really wonderful things to support those who are vulnerable who cannot afford to pay who um you know whose whose welfare <laughs> and benefits are not you know are, are not sufficient for them to live on and i think it's important that you know we do share that and like you say, that we work towards getting some consistent consistency across the board. So in terms of in terms of wide scale reform, you know, I'm not sure how that might look. But I think there's a lot of good practice already in local local um, government. I think that needs to be celebrated. And I think actually if it's shared and talked about enough then you will see other local authorities um, trialing this because you know, engagement equals payment. Even if it is over a slightly longer period of time, we've talked about this before. Um, someone who, 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 um, you know, most people want to pay. They just need a bit of support, a bit of extra time to do it in certain circumstances. And I absolutely agree that enforcement action should be for those who refuse to pay, um, don't think, you know, think they'll get away with not paying. Or sometimes it can just be that valuable tool that engages you know, with the customer and helps us get them back on the right track. But I think there's a lot of good practice there and we need to share it. We need to talk about it. Funny story. I was talking to uh, an unnamed lender around a year ago and their dialer broke and they didn't realise. Their dialer, their outbound dialer that makes the outbound contact with their customers, it broke and they didn't realise for two months and their collections rates went up. Up. <laughs> Zoe's point earlier about local authorities across the country will cite that their practices are better than so and so's or better than so and so's because look at the payment rates. You know what? Ultimately, about 97, 98 percent of people can pay and want to pay, so they do pay, almost regardless of what you do or don't do. So an overly aggressive collections approach is entirely unnecessary. Um, financial services have proven over and over and over again that when you seek to engage to understand first. And then you set plans based on affordability, not based on targets to clear debts by. You end up with sustainable plans that don't break as often and don't cost the organisation more money to reset up, to reconfirm, to chase it broken. Setting up a plan that's going to break in two months is almost as stupid as taking no payments at all. Um, my two pence worth, given that I've never done any local authority debt collection in my life. <laughs> Thank you, Gareth. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I have a question here for everybody in the panel and um, the questions are coming in thick and fast. So um, I'm sure that we're not going to get to answer everybody's questions today. Um, but I do hope at least we can uh, give um, cover some really interesting ones for most people. Um, this 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 person says that um, we have a fixation on saving as a nation 
uh, your point, Gareth, with the, with the uh, 1,600 pounds there on the table. Um, as though, so this fixation, as though it will solve an all ills in finance. However, people can have savings, but still suffer high levels of anxiety with money. And there are those who just don't have money to save. These two things, these two alone should raise questions and concerns that need to be addressed. What does the panel think about that? Um, I'll start with you, Gareth. Okay, so, so yeah, um, stats can be a dangerous thing here, can't they? Um, uh, if you take the traditional financial planning manager question and say, how, what proportion of the country has got three months outgoing set to one side? Well, you can cause an awful lot of anxiety by even suggesting that that should be normal because it's, it's not normal in as much as the majority of the country don't have that. And, and if, that, if you start anchoring that in people's minds as you need to be there before you're normal, you need to be there before you're uh, safe, um, I think you can cause more harm than good. So I do a lot of work with Nationwide and across financial services to try and temper the language around savings. Savings is a good thing. We do have, uh, or at least we had, a savings culture in this country um, that comes from the whole, you, you, try and, you try and do for you and your family, don't you? Um, but I, I think that the availability of savings shouldn't take away from the responsibility of the state to its citizens to have a good social security net that every one of us could depend upon at our time of need, because at the end of the day, most of us, God willing, will become pensioners part of the benefit system and um, a good social security system combined with um, a, an economy where individuals who can save do and have safe places to put their their money and where there are appropriate and affordable sources of credit and insurance to protect the things that are important and make sure that um, people are included in this economy and society financial exclusion is an e is an ill i go so far as to say an evil it causes uh, ramifications across an individual and the household's uh, life and health um, and uh, so I, I promote savings but there's a good way to do it and a really lazy way to do it that can cause more harm than good. Thank you Gareth. Um, Carol what points would you say uh, to, to that to that uh, attendee? I, I don't really have anything to add to what Gareth said of course he, he's absolutely right he has been um, throughout this session 100% agree with him but you know I, I think it, I think actually we need to go back even further and, and, and you know there is an education piece in terms of uh, finance in terms of budgeting that, that is really important and we need to see more of and um, you know whether it's at a young age you know i've heard different reports about how effective that really is but the reality is we do need to see more education around you know um you know around budgeting around priority um payments and around savings and and, and it's it's a whole package in in, in my view of course gareth's right we need a, a, a social security system it ensures you know people have enough to live on and survive on in their hour of need but i think there is a wider education um you know topic that need, needs to be addressed um you know at, at the very top thank you carol um zoe what would you say to those points i think they're perfect and really oh. well put both of them um agree with everything they said I have very little to add I just got a, a comment which may be slightly off, but I think Gareth's point about a, a good social security system. I think it's very strange in this country that everyone expects everyone expects to be slightly responsible for their own health. They try and eat healthily, do exercise. A crisis happens, you run over. You expect you know you expect an organisation to be there for a health crisis. We don't see welfare and we don't see the welfare benefit system in the same way. People plan. People can be up do as much saving or as, as much planning, they get the qualifications so they're always going to get a good job. As much plans as you want. Emergencies happen, emergencies happen, income shock happens just, just in the same way as health shock happens, but they're seen as very, very different. And that, that's always baffled me, that most people will take responsibility, will take responsibility for themselves and their family, but shocks happen to people in life. Um, and we need systems to be able you know, to, to be able to support people through those shocks. And I think both Carol and Gareth have just talked really eloquently about some of those systems that can help people. 
Yeah, and I think that's the, that's the thing as well is that the system as it as it currently is. I mean, this is something I know so you'd agree with that runs through our organisation like our sort of stick of rock, which is you know where there is complexity uh, and uh, uncertainty and lots of complicated information. It's extremely hard to make decisions um, when you've just got well, you don't really know uh, the basis on which to make those decisions. So yeah, I think that that really guides us certainly in terms of the products that we develop. That uh, if you have information then that means then you can make a decision based on the information. But if you don't really know what the situation is, it's very difficult to move on. Yeah. yeah um, no, could I just brilliant. come back on that? For what Gareth just said there, what Carol talked about, the um, the uh, customer journey of Alex um, that she shared with us, is that stigma doesn't help. Stigma doesn't help. And what Gareth was saying, you should have these three months. Or the people who don't want to engage because of stigma. The more we stigmatise the welfare benefit system, the less engagement we get. The less, pe the more people end up in a being really swept away with debts without any ability to sort sort things out. And I think that the way that um, both um, Carol and Gareth approach um, their custom supporting their customers, I think is, is it, it really helps people get back on their feet. Brilliant. Thank you, Zoe. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very conscious of the time that we've run over now. And I do, have, like I say, I do have more questions here. Um, but what I think I'll do is I will ask our panellists to answer them offline, if that's OK, because we're not just we're just not going to get through them all today. Thank you very much to the panellists for the for answering those questions. And apologies if we didn't get to your question, we will get to it offline. So thank you for that. Um, I will just uh, finish up the webinar before handing over now to Sarah to do the demo. Um, just to let you know then that the practical tools that can help. So we talked earlier about, you know, it, it's it, it's, a, it's a doom and gloom environment, but actually there is some positivity and we very much want to bring that um, uh, to you as well. So practical tools that can help. So we talked about the COVID-19 page that we have on our website with all of the up-to-date information on it about all of the government systems uh, and processes and supports. Uh, we've got our benefit and budgeting calculator. It is available for free from gov.uk. Um, there is a more advanced version um, that our uh, guests talked through today who are our clients. And Sarah's going to get, go through that in a moment. Um, I mentioned earlier that our product brochure is, is there. Do, do please download that if you've not already. Um, I will be following up the email with the recording and the slides, also with links as well. Um, immediately after the webinar finishes, there'll be a short survey as well. Um, I I've been asked by um, our founder, Devon Galani, to give a bit of a shout out. So for those of you who uh, work with people on the front line, um, for those of you who work with clients who um, who may have been benefit capped, we did talk, Zoe did touch on the benefit cap earlier. Um, if you've got any stories, be they good or bad, uh, we would love to hear them because Devon is, um, key, we're speaking, we're now invited to speak on a webinar uh, with the universities of Oxford and York, uh, plus CPAG and also somebody with lived experience of being benefit capped um, on a webinar that is ed um, chaired by the editor of Newsnight. Uh, it's next week, I think, on the 26th of November. Um, so we're just putting a shout out. If you've got any stories uh, about how your residents or how your clients have been affected by the benefit cap uh, that you'd like us to share, uh, because we're very keen to make sure that whatever Devon talks about um, is rooted in practical experience. So a bit of a shout out. Do, do let us know your stories. We'd love to hear them. Um, our next webinar, the last one of the year, um, is on the 9th of December. It's a policy review of the year uh, and what a policy year it's been. Um, so Zoe is going to take us through a recap of all of the changes in the policy world uh, that have happened this year and also look forward then to um, 2021. Uh, so do uh, join us for that. The link will be in the follow-up survey. Um, so without further ado, what I would like to do now uh, for those of you who are remaining, uh, is just hand over to Sarah, who's going to take us through a quick demo of the software. Um, so bear with me while I hand over to Sarah right now. Okay, Sarah, that should be coming up on your screen to accept. Perfect. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. That's in view. So thank you to everyone that stayed on and uh, we are sorry that we've run over. I will only take 15 more minutes of your time. Um, and if anybody wants any further information after this demo, then please feel free to contact me and we can arrange something and I can go through a longer winded demo with you that's based on your circumstances as a business and the people you support. 
I'd like to show you a couple of cases that I've pre-built into the calculator. And this is case one. So case one is about a lady, Elise Baker, who was married with two children under the age of seven and one non-dependent living within their property. And she's about to find out, or is found finding out that her husband is about to be made redundant. One of the features of our calculator is the ability to have the current situation while you're speaking with the customer, but also add in the future situation if they know that they're about to prepare for a crisis or a shock in their financial circumstances. And in this case, which is relevant to COVID and furlough ending, is redundancy. And this allows you, whatever sector you're in, to be able to support your customers on a long-term payment arrangement. So if you know that they're going to have a shock in three months' time, then you can prepare for that when you're setting up arrangements with them or signposting them for further advice if they should need it for their budgeting. I've completed the information within the calculator. One thing that I'd like to highlight is the customer experience side, which Gareth and Carol both touched on. The calculator uses dynamic questioning. So Customers will only be posed with questions relevant to their circumstances. In here, you'll see that I've selected couple. However, if this person was single, it wouldn't show, ask them for any information about all of their partner's details. All of the standard stuff is asked here is what you've seen. And I'm sure that you've got in your own systems as well. Number of dependent children, the dates of birth of the children, because we know that the children's ages can affect what eligibility they have to extra support from the welfare system. And the fact that there's a non-dependent, you'll see here the tooltip come on the screen. We have tooltips throughout the calculator and where I touched on earlier that you don't have to be an expert at the welfare system to know that you're giving good advice and guidance to your customers. And these tooltips are key to understanding the outcomes of answering some of these questions. We cover the full range of disability and illness um, support from the welfare system as well, as well as students and non-nationals. We're going through to our property details. You'll see that where I put in my postcode earlier, it's already pulled through who my local council is, and it will then ask for your housing sector. For those of you that are on here from the social housing sector and maybe from the local authorities, we also have the support built in to understand if people have any numbers of rent-free weeks. And the reason it's showing on this case is because I've selected shared ownership. Monthly repayment costs and the rent costs are actually asked. And because we entered our postcode, it can calculate what your liability for your council tax already is. And if customers are unsure of their council tax band, we allow them to find out by just clicking here, and you can do that while you're on the phone to a customer as well. So as much as possible, everything is built into the calculator that stops you having to look in alternative places for information. And if you have the self-serve calculator on your website, your customers can access it and access all the support they need in one place. It makes it a much better user experience for them. We can then move through to our income and earnings. Again, the explanation of what is difference between gross and net. So we don't just assume that people understand what that difference is. And it's good to also notice all of the drop down menus. So dependent on people's understanding of how they're paid, you can select the basis of their understanding. Hold up over here on the right to their monthly situation or their weekly situation. So you actually have no manual calculations to do at all while you're completing the calculator. Again, here, because I selected earnings for work, those are included. This is interesting as well, especially for the people on the phone here from our housing sectors. If somebody's moving into your area and they haven't yet arranged their childcare, but do know that they're going to need childcare, you can click this button to find out what the average hourly rate for childcare cost is. So you can make that assessment for them in advance. And then when they do move into the property, they can actually put in the, the actual amount of the childcare. I'll then take you through to the results screen. Our results aren't just based on numbers and, and writing. We also have some wonderful charts that are built in. So it's very visual for people to use. And you can see the difference between the legacy and the universal credit system. Another key feature is the fact that people can apply 
for their benefits that they're eligible to receive through the tool as well. So people don't have to print and download this and complete it and then work out how to make the application for what they're eligible to receive. It's all done within the same, stool, same tool, so it makes it much easier for everybody. Here are the alerts. So this shows what these, this particular family could be eligible to receive. And if I open them up, they're very detailed. So we have debt advice support that's eligible for this family, help to save accounts, free prescriptions, rent shortfalls. Here you can see some of the graphics that I spoke about as well. So this family will be worse off under universal credit by £192.65. And you can also hear where I explained earlier, if someone's moving on to furlough, you can change their wages per hour, their weekly hours work simply on a slider. So if this customer said, I'm going to lose some of my hours, they'll actually show how worse off that customer is going to be and what difference that's going to make to their eligibility to support from the welfare system. You can also look for work based on different type of work skills within your postcode and search and find a job as well. So everything is built into here to make it as easy as possible for you and your customers. The full budget is available, which, as we mentioned earlier, does conform to the standard financial statement. It brings through the information that's already been inputted into the calculator for the household details. So wherever you've already put in your mortgage payment, your rent and your council tax, those will self-populate into the entering the cost section. I've completed a full budget here for this customer. And this is where we also show the cost savings. So here is the disposed, negative disposable income for this family, what their income is and what their outgoings are and how the breakdown of those costs is shown. And also here is a pie chart. And here is where you can see the cost of living data derived from ONS data. So for this customer, it shows where they're spending more per month than similar households in their area. So you can actually give your, your customers some guidance as to where they may be able to reduce their outgoings and improve their financial resilience. And here we say how those costs equate on a weekly, monthly and annual basis. And I think seeing it on an annual basis, I've spoken to some of my clients and they've said that it's, their customers have said that to be able to see this on an annual basis makes a difference because they can actually relate it to their salary and it does make them question those outgoings a little bit deeper. You can also, for those of you that like to see the SFS spending guidelines and have signed up to the money, of science, money and um, service, see the difference between your costs and the SFS spending guidelines here as well, broken down into all the categories. So you've got the customer's costs, the SFS spending guidelines, and the difference between those costs. And everything can be printed and downloaded as a PDF, so you can send it to your customers in an email or in the post if you want to. For the scenarios, you'll see here, as I mentioned earlier, I've actually factored in that this customer's husband is about to be made redundant. What the calculator does is it pulls through all of the information from the previous situation and it allows you to make the changes in circumstances they're about to have. And the changes, as I said, for this family is that her husband is actually going to be made redundant. So they're able to see clearly here what difference that's going to make to their situation. And if we click onto the results, the difference that's going to make for their disposable income after the redundancy. So it'll show clearly in advance what they need to do to try and help themselves and reduce their outgoings. And as we know, to apply for their support from the welfare system when they're faced with that redundancy. I've got another case that I'd like to show you here. So this is a case for a gentleman called Peter Butler. And it's, it's good to notice here as well that you can bring up all of your case histories. So if you're triaging a customer over time, and if your advisor has spoken to a customer a number of times and, and changed the case over a number of times, you can see all of those changes as well. So you don't just have to see the current case within the calculator. So I'm going to click into the case with Peter Butler. This is a single gentleman living on his own, he owns his property. And this is an, this, the reason I'm showing this assessment is this gentleman isn't eligible to support from the welfare system. And some of our clients use the tool purely to do an affordability assessment and complete an income and expenditure. So the calculator not only allows you to do this, the eligibility for additional support, 
But if you want to use it in separate teams within your business that purely do an affordability assessment, you can do that as well without having to go through the full journey for the eligibility for support. And you've got your budget here, which I've completed. And again here, you'll see the results are there, which shows their income and their outgoing, their, their negative disposable income again here after cost. So for the debt advice, advisors that are there for the people here that are in the debt collection industry and the lending industry even if somebody's in full-time employment and we know that their income won't allow them to be eligible for support from the welfare system and they've got no children the tool is still really good for you to be able to use purely to do your income assessment and your affordability for this customer and again you can download and pdf it and email reports over to other people within your business as well we touched earlier as well on the UC calendar. Now, even though this gentleman isn't entitled to any universal credit, you'll see here it says zero. If you've got someone that's on a zero hour contract or is working shifts, and so their hours of work changes from month to month, you'll be able here to allow them to understand what their eligibility of support from the universal credit system is month by month so you can prepare them for the fluctuations on the money they're going to be getting in from the welfare system lots of other features within the calculator as well i haven't got time to go through all of them i think i've probably run over pretty much the 15 minutes but we have advice local here so based on your postcode you put one in you can actually choose different advice topics and then when you hit go, it will take you off to see those advice centres within your local areas, finding a basic bank account. And here you can also add actions, which can all be printed out for your customers. So I'm just going to call this redundancy and a target date. You'll put a date in for this action that you've agreed with the customer. You add it to the case. And then when you print out this case and send it to the customer, It'll show what those agreed actions are that you've given them to do or that you've agreed you'll do. And that way you can track the different things and allow customers to understand that, yes, you've said that you'll do these certain things by these dates. So people can keep a track. And if they're undergoing stress at the moment and it's too much for them to do everything at once, you can actually do things separately for them within those actions calendar. So that's a whistle stop tour for the affordability and the budgeting calculator. Um, as I said, if anybody want any further information or you'd like to have a demo with you or your wider team, please feel free to get in touch. You've got all of our contact details and it's been lovely to speak to you all today and have you all online. Thank you for attending. Brilliant, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, to make myself presenter again, just to finish up the webinar. Um, so if I do that. Uh, Okay, there we go. Um, hopefully, I you can see on my screen right now uh, instead of Sarah's um, coming up. Okay. Um, okay. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Sarah, for a very interesting uh, demonstration. Uh, whistle stop, as Sarah said, um, but do please um, get in touch um, and uh, ask for more, something that might be more bespoke to you uh, if you want to go over some of the uh, features that Sarah talked about in more detail. Now, finishing up, and it just leaves me to say uh, with absolute heartfelt thanks, and I'm sure you would agree uh, that the sessions that our guest speakers gave today were absolutely wonderful. Um, so I'd like to give my sincere thanks to Carol Kenny uh, from Cedar Group and also president of Civia, uh, and also Gareth McNabb from the Nationwide Building Society, um, and also my colleagues Zoe, Zoe Charlesworth from policy and practice and you just heard there Sarah Lambert from policy and practice it's been great to have everybody on the call today thank you very much for joining us um, I'm going to close the webinar now and you will find that uh, automatically served then is the survey uh, and would really appreciate it if you could take the time to do that uh, it's been great thank you everybody um, and I hope you have a great rest of the day thanks everybody take care bye bye now <laughs>